All right, here we have Eve Salty, Senior Director at Microsoft. And when we were babies, you know, we used to work together. Yeah. Uh, since she's only 25 and I'm only... 20 years ago, right? Or 17 years ago? No. We are geniuses, so we started working at age 10. Yes. Uh, ago. So, and we kept in touch. Uh, since I'm from, uh, let's see, east of Greece, and she's from actual Greece. We're sort of uh, uh, siblings. Right? Yes. Yeah, Eastern Grecian. <laughs> so without further ado, I will ask Eve my first question. First of all, thank you so much for taking thank the you. time. Good to see I you again. We will uh, look at this video. We'll enjoy it tremendously. So let's get started. What do you do these days, Eve? Wow, that's a, a big question. First of all, thank you so much for having me in the podcast. Great to see you again. I know it's been a long time and a lot of things changed. Um, so uh, what I do, what I do these days, uh, the, the thing is like uh, after uh, I came back to Microsoft uh, two and a half years ago, I was, uh, uh, as you know, like when we used to work together, I was at Microsoft for about like 16 plus years doing lots of different things, primarily in the product development side, uh, but also a lot with business development and sales. So, um, and then I was recruited by Google and I spent there like about three and a half years. And now I came back to Microsoft and it's been busy. Uh, so, um, um, as you said, I'm uh, in the product, in the engineering team for Azure AI. And although we have been doing AI for the past 25 five plus years through the pre-trained tra traditional AI models that we have, leveraging all the research centers we have across the world, blah, blah, blah. Um, now, I think uh, we've seen kind of like, you know, the proliferation of generative AI and uh, everything seems to be exploding right now. Um, uh, I do. Crazy, right? It took the world it by is. storm, literally. Exactly. And it's kind of like interesting because like, you know, there there has been kind of like a lot of evolution around artificial in intelligence since like the 1950s and the 60s, right? And then in the 90s, we saw like more about like, you know, machine lear learning and, you know, training from day, day data. Then we see kind of like, you know, we saw how deep learning came about in the 2000s. Um, and uh, now in the 2020s, we see the explosion of generative AI. And uh, we're kind of in the middle of it now. There is a lot of demand. There is a lot of hype. Uh, if, you, if you see the Gartner uh, trend, you see the generative AI is at that kind of like top hype um, uh, life cycle stage. Uh, it's a good thing and it's a, it's a challenging or interesting thing. So from my vantage point, um, you know, we are um, kind of like, you know, working a lot with OpenAI. As you know, we have kind of like this exclusive um, generative AI models that are part of the Azure AI portfolio. And these are kind of like really interesting models, um, large lang language mo models um, that really democratize the way that AI is used across every department, every organization in every in industry. So, you know, with GPT-4, you can, you know, use uh, natural lang language, so English or whatever your choice of la language is to uh, create content, to create a, a tagline, to create an email. Um, also with co Codex, this is an interesting uh, evolution for developers, right? Uh, when you have to write hundreds of, you know, thousands of lines of code, it's good to have a copilot, a coding copilot to help you kind of like, you know, get rid and automate, uh, get rid of or automate a lot of the repetitive work that you do. And also it helps with documentation that no developer wants to, to do. Um, and then the other, the fun one, as I say, the DALI one, which is basically using, again, natural lang language to uh, create an image. 
uh, a very creative Im image, an image that, you know, has not been kind of like, you know, developed before. So it really uh, enables, you know, kind of like creators, artists, uh, marketers to, you know, really depict their vision in a very kind of like accurate and also creative way. And there are a lot of others that, um, you know, and of course, the chat GPT that everybody knows and everybody uses, mm -hmm. uh, which is the conversational AI piece. So kind of like, you know, it creates that Q&A cap capability um, that has a lot of different uh, applications. So it's been it's been busy. It's been interesting. And um, what and despite kind of like the hype that I see with everyone talking about Gen AI and having an opinion about Gen AI is more about the combination of the different models that you can mix and match in order to do, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever kind of like that task is. Um, so I see more of that, more of kind of like composite scenarios rather than uh, kind of like the common misconception that I think exists right now that generative AI models will solve every application and every use case that you have. I see the exact opposite. I, I see the combination of different capabilities that address a particular uh, use case. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... You were at Microsoft, then you went to Google, and then you came back and all of a sudden all this stuff is happening. And some might argue that uh, you were quite instrumental in you know, making a lot of- I can't of take credit for, for it. <laughs> so busy, of course. But uh, let's say you weren't doing what you're doing. And let's say I put a gun to your head and say, hey, you know, yeah, sure, there's hype, but there's a lot of opportunity too. So you are to start a, a tech company utilizing some aspects of AI. I know it's a humongous uh, yeah. uh, field, but what would you do, Eve? Well, I think there are a lot of different options. Um, and you're right, this is kind of like the right time to be thinking about, well, how can we use this uh, very powerful te technology um, to automate, streamline, um, you know, support a lot of uh, operations that we see and really drive innovation. Um, I think about kind of like different possible applications in terms of ver verticals or different industries per se. Um, the one that I'm really excited and very hopeful is uh, uh, I would do something in the healthcare space. Uh, personally, I'm not a healthcare expert, so obviously I wouldn't be doing it, but I think there are a lot of interesting applications in terms of uh, predictive analytics, uh, disease prevention, personalized treatment recommendation. We see a lot. I see a lot of opportunity in the medical imaging uh, space. Um, also, I think there is a way to use AI to really democratize healthcare for everyone, especially now here in the US where, you know, we we are really at a deficit when it comes to healthcare support with uh, bringing healthcare services closer to the patient through a virtual health uh, assistant that is powered by, you know, kind of like the knowledge base that uh, a healthcare association or uh, organization has. So healthcare, I think it's something, you know, it's a very, very interesting space. I know it's a highly regulated space. So, you know, things might move a little bit slower, but the possibilities of innovation in kind of like bringing health healthcare closer to patients, supporting Do doctors and medical staff in really identifying some anomalies um, that sometimes we can't really, uh, you know, uh, really de de detect with our plain sight. And also because the ratio of patients by medical staff is really high. So I think, uh, you know, if we can use AI to really free up time for the do doctor or the nurse to spend more time with a patient in a more qualitative way, I think we've done a great job. Um, also, um, 
I think uh, in terms of uh, education, which I know this is a controversial uh, space because the I think we've seen a lot of resistance from education uh, experts, uh, both on the K through 12 and on the higher ed side uh, towards AI. I would take um, uh, the opposite approach, to be honest. I would, I would, uh, uh, I see AI powered tools as essential for driving personalized lear lear learning. Um, and we've seen a couple of uh, uh, examples with uh, tu tutoring ser services. I think it's well known that not every student learns the same way. Um, and uh, everyone has their own kind of like idiosyncrasies. Everybody needs like their own learning path. And uh, again, because educators are dealing with classes of 30, 40 plus uh, uh, different kids, they won't have the time to kind of like, you know, personalize uh, the learning path for each student. So this is where AI becomes really a, a game cha cha changer. Um, we can put it to use to create kind of like either an automated grading sy system or intelligent tu tutoring sy systems. This really personalizes the journey for each student and frees us time, frees up time uh, for the educator to spend more quality time with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so these are a couple of them that I think, you know, we'll see really massive uh, uh, applications. Another one, um, uh, and the last la last one, um, again, highly regulated industry as, as well, but I see a lot of, um, you know, potential applications there is with financial ser services. Um, I think there is a lot of manual work um, that we can automate. Um, there is a lot of... Uh, um kind of like you know uh work around uh, creating algorithms for uh de detecting fraud which i think is on the rise especially in this you know challenging macroeconomic environment and in this kind of like you know global kind of like you know cyber space especially now with the you know with the recent introduction of cryptocurrency and all of that we've seen an increase in fraud uh so if we can use ai to uh drive fraud de detection um, if uh, again we can use it for any customer service personalizing kind of like the communication or any other advisory ser services. Um, I think that's also an interesting set of use cases. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you for that. Now moving on to the last and the, perhaps the funnest part of uh, our time together. So AGI. Will we will we be enslaved by AI or is it a, a stochastic parrot and nothing to worry about? Like what's the what's gonna happen ten years from today? Or twenty or five? Yeah, or... well, I mean, if I knew that, I would uh, be somewhere else. No, but I mean I don't have a crystal ball, um, and I can't really make predictions, but again, I think a common misconception across the board is that uh, the AI models and the generative AI models that we have right now are 100% accurate uh, or they're 100% unbiased or uh, that, um, you know, we can depend on them 100%. And I would say that this is not the case. What we currently have is something very powerful, is something with great potential. Uh, it's a great tool to help us do our work better, to free us, you know, time to do better things that, you know, involve critical thinking and creativity, things that we humans are great at, but it's not replacing any of the 
uh, kind of like, you know, creativity, the innovation, the decision making that humans bring into the equation. Uh, and you mentioned the term stochastic parrot. We still see even in the most powerful and sophisticated AI mo models, they're not, you know, they're still times where they're hallucinating. Uh, they're not really... Um, uh, they're not yielding necessarily the right results. I think we need that. That's why there is a, kind of like a process in adopting AI that we all need to take it. So it's not something to use off the shelf. It's not something to use without further fine tuning it to the environment that you want it to yield re re results, further training them, uh, grounding these models in the data that you have from your organization, from your industry, uh, from your set of day, day, data, and then monitoring the results that it comes up with. Um, we are responsible for creating and advancing this AI te technologies. Um, but I think uh, we are still very far from uh, having them have, you know, kind of like uh, operate in a in an independent way. And also, I think there is an opportunity not only for uh, us in the tech space, uh, but also in collaboration with governments, with regulatory bodies, to really introduce regulation into the AI space. Um, there are, you know, there needs to be some governance. There needs to be, a, you know, a conversation around creating guardrails, around addressing bias, fairness, ensuring the privacy and data protection uh, is there, and making sure that we promote transparency and driving accountability for, for, for that. A lot of times, models tend to be conceived as black boxes and we need to uh, really uh, change the equation we need to make sure that we uh, ensure that these models are very transparent they're traceable um, and we continue to QA and you know further fine-tune them so that uh, uh, we know that they're yielding the right results we're very far from that I think we have a long way to go um, but I, and I also think we all have a res responsibility, whether you're on the tech side, creating these mo models, whether you're on the customer or partner side, really leveraging these this models to kind of like, you know, innovate or automate or optimize your operations or what you're trying to do, or whether you're in the government space. And um, yeah, so I'm very hopeful and very optimistic um, but I think uh, this is going to be a long journey. Well, I tell you, wise words from the one and only Eve Salty. Uh, <laughs> again, thank you so much. I mean, this means a lot to a lot of people. Uh, you dis demystified quite a bit of things, and you also added uh, a lot of optimism and a lot of uh, good pointers. So thank you. And uh, yeah, God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> it was good 